Do you want to do, like, I guess we'll do a few of these. Ready to go? Okay. So is that, so how does that sound? Yes, okay, good evening. Assalamu alaikum, Ramadan Mubarak. On behalf of the program in Arab and Muslim American Studies at the University of Michigan, I welcome you to tonight's timely and no doubt thought-provoking lecture, The Limits and Possibilities of Black Palestinian Transnational Solidarity, by Dr. Mark Lamont Hill. I have the honor of introducing our esteemed guest, but before I do so, I would like to make a land acknowledgement. The program in Arab and Muslim American Studies and the Department of American Culture acknowledge the university's origins in a land grant from the Ashinabeg, including Odawa, Ojibwe, and Budoadomi, and Wyandot. And we further acknowledge that our university stands like almost all property in the United States on lands obtained generally in unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. Knowing where we are changes neither the past nor the present. However, through scholarship and pedagogy, we work to create a future in which the past is thoroughly understood and the present supports human flourishing and justice while enacting an ethic of care and compassion. Tonight's guest, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, is the Steve Charles Professor of Media, Cities, and Solutions at Temple University. Hill is known for his work addressing the intersections of race, justice, politics, and culture in the United States and globally. His books include We Still Hear, Pandemics, Policing, Protests, and Possibility, Nobody, Casualties of America's War on the Vulnerable from Flint to Ferguson, Beats, Rhymes, and Classroom Life, Hip Hop Pedagogy and the Politics of Identity, The Classroom and the Cell, Conversations on Black Life in America, co-authored with the journalist and political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal, and forthcoming Seen and Unseen, Technology, Social Media, and the Fight for Racial Justice. And that's just a few of them. He's very prolific. <laughs> Um, an award-winning journalist and author, Hill has received numerous prestigious awards from the U U.S. National Association of Black Journalists, GLAAD, and the International Academy of Digital Arts and Science. Hill is a host of BET News, The Grio, and the AJE Upfront. Hill is an abolitionist, anthropologist, bookstore owner, shout out to Uncle Bobby's, I've been there, it's real nice, <laughs> um, an author, a Sixers fanatic, as per his IG profile. Um, North Philly born, West Philly bred, Kappa made. Um, there's a lot to be said, I think, about, said and made about this term public intellectual. But for me and mine, um, Hill represents the best of what that term can offer our struggles. What it means to do public work as an intellectual for the public. To study, to teach, and to organize. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Mark Lemon Hill. Thank you, thank you. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. I, um, I'm so excited to be here. I was just saying, I'm in Michigan and it's not four degrees. <laughs> it's, it's already miracles happening. I, uh, I'm also excited to uh, engage this topic, uh, thinking about black Palestinian solidarity. And I'm especially excited to be thinking about and engaging this topic at this juncture in history, at this moment, uh, where I think so many things are at stake, so many things are urgent, as they always are, but where there remains a promise of possibility for how we can move forward toward freedom and justice. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking specifically, uh, heavy on my mind right now are the people uh, of Hawara, uh, who uh, have been the victims of a vicious, awful, onslaught, what even Israeli officials are calling a pogrom, uh, which is emblematic of the type of ritual, uh, daily violence to which Palestinians are subjected every single day. And so this is heavy on my mind as I talk about this, but this question of, of Palestinian solidarity, black Palestinian transnational solidarity is incredibly important. Uh, for me, my entry into the conversation on black Palestinian uh, solidarity, it, I, I, I'd read for years, I'd done work for years, but it really, for me, goes to the summer of 2014. 
summer of 2014, when we were in the streets of Ferguson. Mike Brown had been killed. He'd been shot down on the ground in Canfield by Darren Wilson on August 9th, 2014. And we rushed to Ferguson to cover it as journalists. We rushed there as activists. We rushed there as organizers. Uh, there was a generation of people who really got their sea legs as organizers and activists in Ferguson. And Ferguson summer for so many of us was a transformative moment. And when we were in Ferguson marching for justice, so many things were happening. And I remember being on the streets of Ferguson and I remember protesting and I remember the police and I remember the media and I remember social media going off. We were all trying to narrate what was happening on the streets of Ferguson. And in many ways, what was happening on the streets of Ferguson uh, was being narrated by corporate media in ways that stood in stark contrast to what we were experiencing on the ground. They would say, a curfew has been uh, gently imposed. We were getting hit. They were saying smoke bombs were being dropped. They were tear gas. Tear gas was being dropped. And anyone who's ever been tear gas knows you don't confuse tear gas with anything else. And yet the media was narrating in one way. But we on the ground were having a very different experience. Part of that was the media conversation. Part of that were organizing strategies. Part of that was the kind of dislocation of our political center from the church to the street. But another piece of it was what we were talking about in the street, what we were marching for in the street. We were doing the, the, the you know, we don't get it, shut it down chants. We were um, chanting to indict, convict, send them crooked cops to jail. Those chants, chants that as an abolitionist I find deeply problematic. That's another lecture for another time. Uh, but we could talk about that. But then there was also from Ferguson to Palestine, occupation is a crime. As we were chanting for justice, every once in a while you'd hear intifada, intifada in the background. We saw lots of red, black, and green. I should say, we saw a lot of black nationalist flags. We saw a lot of uh, RBG black traditional kind of colors, but we also saw Palestinian colors. I, I realized the colors ain't that different. We, we saw that too. I blame the colonialists. Um, and so we saw kafia. We heard things, we saw things, and we were having these interesting conversations. And I brought up the tear gas because I, there was a particular night, there was a particular moment where we'd been tear gassed really badly. And we were trying to get back into the car. I remember some of us were trying to get into the, just get into anybody's car just to get out of there. We were trying to breathe. And at that same night, I didn't find this out until the next morning, um, but the same night, there were Palestinians in the West Bank, people like Mariam Barghouti, who were protesting themselves. Of course, that same Ferguson summer was also the summer of a 51-day onslaught by the Israeli military on Gaza. And there was a response that was in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, and, and Maryam and others were in the West Bank protesting what was happening in Gaza as it was happening around the world. And they were saying to us, and they were tweeting out these interesting notes. They were saying things like, oh, you know, you want to stand closer to the soldiers. It's counterintuitive, but stand a little bit closer because they're not going to tear gas you as likely if you're real close to them. They were saying things like, you know, wash your eyes out with this or, or take your T-shirt off and wrap it around your head like this. And if you do those things, you'll be able to defend and protect yourself from the state. So there were some very tactical, strategic, practical, in the moment forms of solidarity that were emerging from Palestine to us at the same time that we were, many of us in this moment, uh, acknowledging for the first time, particularly for the younger activists, the state violence that was happening in Palestine. And so it was within that context that we saw what Nora Erekat and I talk about is a renewal of black Palestinian transnational solidarity. Now the reason I use the language of renewal is because this ain't the first time. 
There was a conversation that would make someone think that this was the first time. There were political discourses that made it sound like somehow we were being co-opted by, by crazy Arab terrorists who were luring good, well-meaning Americans into this struggle. And, and conversely, that, that there were some black Americans who had traditionally been down with Israel by, by right, by tradition, by, by civil rights duty, and, and, and somehow we we're being lulled away from that harmonious relationship and somehow being pulled into a conflict, I'm using their language, not mine, it ain't a conflict, it's an occupation, but we were being lured into a conflict that had nothing to do with us. But that's not the story of black Palestinian transnational solidarity. It's far more nuanced, it's far deeper, it's far more complicated than anything could be told in a news cycle. But there's something profoundly untrue about the way that it was being constructed. We stood there in Palestine, we stood there in Ferguson, we stood there all around the country exercising forms of solidarity that <clears throat> had existed for decades. We were in a tradition. You think about September 1964, when Malcolm X is uh, writing for the Egyptian Gazette and he writes, that essay or newspaper article at the time on Zionist logic, where Malcolm was reframing the conversation. This is three years effectively before the 1967 war. He's, he's framing the conversation of Israel and Israel's place strategically in the, in the Middle East as an, first as a, as, a, as a feature of colonialism, of European colonialism. He's seen it as, an, as just a, the newer form of it. And he's talking about the strategic ge geopolitical positioning of, of Israel in relation to other Arab nations and how it serves a strategic economic purpose. So Malcolm is part of a tradition of, of and within the black radical tradition of getting us to understand Israel and, and, and Palestine as well, not purely through the lens of, of, uh, of, of liberation for, for Zionists, not even purely through the language of colonialism, but also through the language of racial capitalism. He's forcing us to think about how the, co the construction of a nation state and the racialization of various groups of people for the purpose of economic extraction is central to the construction and the formation of the Israeli nation state. When we think about how identity is constructed, when we think about not, not, not just is Israel-Palestine, but even within even the kind of internecine inter conversations about racialization within the Israeli state, you're talking about a, a formation that allows for particular forms of economic extraction. When you think about, when, but, but, but let, me, let, me, let me focus first on this question of, of, of Zionism. And, 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 and when Zionists uh, join the early Yeshuv and they, and, and they come over into historic Palestine and we begin to see things like the Jewish National Fund emerge. We begin to see the, the public use of land, which is constructed in such a way that only certain people had access to it, i.e. Palestinians didn't. And so the, the process of racialization at that moment was a mechanism by which the state could decide who had access to goods and who didn't, who had access to land and who didn't, who had access to employment and at some point underemployment, right, through the process of racialization. Malcolm didn't go as deep into the kind of history of, of, historic, of, of Palestine, but what Malcolm was getting at was this idea that this journey of racialization, that this journey of identity or this, this, this project of identity was bound up in, 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 in capitalist logics. And as Cedric Robinson says, all capitalism is racial capitalism. So this becomes part of how we think and talk about Israel. 1967, I'm fast forward. 1967, after the war, SNCC writes a powerful newsletter on the 1967 war. Again, framing it through the language of neo-colonialism, offering a rejoinder to the dominant Western narrative and the dominant mainstream civil rights narrative of what was happening. Because again, SNCC is, is pushing back against not just the SELC, but a long tradition of folk who either ignored the issue or echoed the dominant narrative. Think about W.E.B. Du Bois. We, 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 could, we could talk about uh, his framing. Uh, 10 years, my math ain't that good. 19 years earlier, right, on the formation of the state of Israel when Du Bois is talking about this as a victory. He's talking about Israel being a, a nation that is formed out of 
uh, effectively nothingness. He's talking about Muhammadism. I mean, he, he, he's appropriating and, and, and demonstrating so many Orientalist tropes about, about Palestine and about the, the, the Middle East in general as a way of framing or justifying the occupation, or not the occupation at that moment, but the, the formation of the state. We can, we, can use, we can language it differently in a moment. And so SNCC is pushing back against that. Now we're seeing a shift in how we think and how we talk about it. We're seeing the rise of black internationalism. We're thinking about black folk and black activists and black organizers are now beginning to think about their relationship, not just to each other in the United States, to other oppressed people in the United States, but they're beginning to think about themselves in a global conversation. They're also beginning to understand the frameworks of power as being global, the, the oppressive forces as being uh, 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 international. Now, this isn't the first moment that this happens, right? We had, we had the same moment with the Nation of Islam in some ways, right? The Nation of Islam was also formed around a global political imaginary, as, as people have taught us, like Alex Lubin and others, right? That, that there is a global political imaginary that's being framed when you talk about the Asiatic black man. There's, there's, a, there's a certain framework where you talk about Muslim as an, it, it, not just as a, uh, as a faith marker, an identity marker of religiosity, but also as a kind of mark of, of, uh, of the intersections of, of race and religion and identity in a global context when you read Nation of Islam lessons. All of this stuff is happening. So it's not the first time, but now Malcolm, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, SNCC is relocating this into a very particular political, radical political vocabulary that's now increasingly legible to a broader group in, of international black and brown folk, right? So these are the traditions we're talking about. We're talking about June Jordan. We're talking about Angela Davis. We're talking, I would argue, and, and these are debate. We're talking about really the last days of Martin King, and Robin Kelly writes and talks about this quite interestingly, that Martin King at, at, at a moment, despite all the propaganda, at, by, by his last moments, he was deeply concerned with what was happening in the West Bank. He was deeply concerned uh, about the way, and he didn't want to accept an invitation from the Israeli prime minister. By his last days, he didn't want to sign the basic statement when all the uh, black leaders signed a statement of support of Israel in the New York Times. He said he, he, he reluctantly participated but didn't want to. He had deep questions about Jerusalem. So all of this stuff is happening against the backdrop of these other socio, uh, sociopolitical currents. And so by the time you have this moment in, uh, in, in 2014 uh, where black folk are organizing and speaking about Palestine, this is not new. It's a renewal. It's a renewal of energies that had been squashed by multiple forces. It had been squashed by Oslo in 1993. It radically shifts the geopolitical framework. It had been squashed by the end of the Cold War, which changed the terms of engagement. It had been squashed by COINTELPRO, it had been, which, which dismantled many ways the, and took the radical teeth out of so many black organizations in the United States and destroyed organizations like the Black Panther Party, which was literally taking speeches from the PLO chair, right, Yasser Arafat at the time, and publishing it in their newspaper. But it's also important when we talk and we think about these solidarities to understand that they weren't happening in one direction. We weren't simply here fetishizing. Black folk weren't just fetishizing the Middle East. Black folk weren't just worshiping at the altar of, of, of very narrow uh, understandings of Islam, therefore subjecting us to South Asian and, and, and sort of uh, 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 Arab sort of idol worship as it were. But people were learning lessons from the struggles of black folk in the West. Think about what's happening in 1948 when the Israeli nation state is constructed and those first few years when there were people who who, Jews who had moved there were living in camps. Uh, and some of those camps were very, 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 uh, they, they produced very difficult times. Some people had better housing than others, but there were people who were living in the worst of slums. So a lot of those people, 80% of those people, by most measures, were Mizra Mizrahi, the Mizraim. And they protested. They pushed back. You go from 600,000 in 1948 to almost doubling that population by 1953, 1954, suddenly you have a density and not enough housing, and people had bad housing options. But again, the accommodations were made for Ashkenazim, not as much for the Mizraim. 
folk from Morocco, folk from Iraq, folk from throughout the diaspora. And so they organized and they pushed and they protested. And fast forward a decade, they're organizing, and they're pushing, and they're protesting, and now they're in a full-fledged slum. Now they're in, in, in for places like um, Musrara, which is part of the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the governorate of, uh, of Jerusalem. And they're organizing. And what do they call themselves? The Black Panthers of Jerusalem. Why would they call themselves the Black Panthers of Jerusalem? Because for them, blackness was a signifier that signified a certain kind. It's two things. One, blackness signified a certain kind of identity of injustice, identity of, of oppression, identity of state violence, and, I, and, and on the recipient end of it, that is to say. They, they understood that blackness signified a certain, even on a global scale, a certain kind of vulnerability to death, to premature death. They understood that, and so they took on blackness as a trope, and they also understood that their relationship to the Israeli state, which itself is predicated on a certain kind of commitment to, to perfecting a certain vision of whiteness. They understood who they were in relation to that nation. And so they took on the nation, the idea of the Black Panther Party of Self-Defense. They took the iconography on. They took on some of the organizing strategies. They protested. They refused to leave until, they would, until the, 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 the state would meet with them. Golda Meir said that name and those people kept her up at night. That's saying something. And so the Black Panther Party of Jerusalem itself becomes another sort of moment where we understand the relationship and the transnational solidarity on both sides that's occurring. And these moments persist. And while I'm, my talk today and what I'm talking about is largely based in the United States, we could think about this in the context of South Africa, both before and after Nelson Mandela's release, they, they have an incredibly strong commitment. There are, these, there are these sort of media spectacle moments, for example, when, 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 when uh, Nelson Mandela is asked to denounce Yasser Arafat, and he says, I will not. He says, you cannot tell me who my friends or my enemies are. We, could, we, we see this in the continent of Africa, we see this in Latin America, because sometimes when we talk about political solidarities, we tend to uh, spend more time on North-North relationships and not think about the relationships and the solidarity movements that occur between and among the global South, even among black folk. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to replicate that, that's just not the work that I do. Um, um, graduate students, whenever you do work, there's always gonna be somebody that's gonna tell you to do something different. You can say, that's really important, that's just not the work that I'm, that's, that's not my project. <laughs> just, just practice saying that, any graduate students in the room. Um, checking time too. I know, I know it's Ramadan, so folk, you know, the suburb might not be quite there just yet. Um, so we, so, so we, we think about these solidarities and this long tradition of solidarity and I talked a little bit about the interruptions to those, those traditions, from Oslo to Cold War to COINTELPRO, uh, to the advances of the civil rights movement, which, which simply domesticated many, much of our political vision, such that we weren't necessarily thinking about internationalist approaches, but rather neoliberal visions of what it meant to be free within the context of the United States, access to capital, access to political participation, moments like the Indiana Political Convention, Right, all, all in, in the 1970s, all of these moments sort of marked a way in which the black politics became increasingly de-radicalized. So that's part of what makes this moment in 2015 incredibly important, or 2016 incredibly uh, important. Because in 2016, when Mike Brown is killed, or 2014 when Mike Brown is killed, forgive me, when 2014 when Mike Brown is killed, we're also seeing the rise of grassroots black organizations which have a deep and profound commitment to, uh, to the rat, black radical tradition. Right? When the Dream Defenders comes out of Florida, for example, the Dream Defenders is an organization that starts with who? Philip Agnew, a black radical activist who's from Chicago, but organizes in Miami. Who else? Ahmed Abu Znaid, a Palestinian. 
family from Jerusalem, who comes to the United States, attends school in Florida, develops a friendship with Phil, but they also are organizing together. They're working together. They're looking at the intersections of their struggle together. And, and so the Dream Defenders, as one of their important interventions and important projects, sees the work of delegations as critical. And, and, and I know Charles Davis was here, a faculty member here, a brilliant faculty member here, uh, is beginning to write and think about uh, solid uh, delegation work and, and, and Palestinian uh, black solidarity projects. And, and, and part of that work was this thing that Malcolm X talks about as engaged witness. This idea of saying it's not enough for us to write and think about this, but black folk need to go to Palestine. They need to witness this on their own. And I was actually part of the first, I've been a part of actually every Dream Defenders delegation, among others. But when we, but you go there and now you're seeing things on the ground. So the solidarity work is not merely about reading or understanding or, or, or calling the name of Palestine or calling the name of Mike Brown or Trayvon Martin, but it's about saying, how can we organize and build together? But I can't do that until I see the conditions on the ground, until we engage with folk on the ground. So this becomes part of the work of it, right? Black Lives Matter, the, 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 the organization, before we, not, um, the broader movement for Black Lives is a different conversation, but Black Lives Matter, when it's founded by Opal Tometi and Alicia Garza and, and, and Patrice Cullors, one of the things that was in their opening statement, in their, in, their, in their opening documents, right, in their founding documents, excuse me, was a commitment to Palestine. Now, there were debates about whether to use words like genocide and apartheid in the opening documents, and there were debates and tensions and revisions but in that opening moment, there was a commitment to this. There was a, commo a commitment to using the language of, of apartheid, the language of genocide to describe the conditions in Palestine because there was a deep commitment to a black radical tradition that was always highlighting th those issues. And so part of why we saw the renewal in 2014 was because in 2014, we saw a profound shift back from these grassroots organizing moments into this. These are the same people that are calling for police abolition and prison abolition into a, you know, to me, less provocative defunding, but still a, a, a somewhat radical move. These things are happening simultaneously. And so we're beginning to see this. Now, this, and, and another moment that, that creates the black Palestinian transnational solidarity, frankly, is the shift toward authoritarianism in both places. At the very same time that there's a Trump administration that is, uh, wild in every way imaginable, but not that out of step on Palestine, by the way. I mean, there's, a, there's certain things with UNRWA and other things where, where Trump was a little, or, or, or acknowledging the Golan, but in general, Trump's position toward Palestine was just more honest. He was, he was US foreign policy on steroids. He wasn't, he wasn't a new type of foreign policy. He was just a more aggressive iteration of it. Moving the embassy, the Jerusalem Embassy Act was founded under, uh, was, was drafted under uh, Bill Clinton. Most presidents just punt and they, they, find, they sign a, 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 a six month or, or whatever extension on it. Every six months they just say, yeah, we'll wait another six months. And they've been waiting another six months for 30 years. And Trump just said, I'm not signing an extension. We're going to move it. But fundamentally, it was an American policy that was already in place. But as Trump is moving toward the right, we also see in Israel a Netanyahu government that was becoming increasingly obstinate, increasingly recalcitrant, moving further and further to the right, and also being far more, uh, again, transparent and honest about its commitment to dismantling any commitment to Palestinian rights. Now, we understood after 1993, after the Oslo Agreement, that that wasn't going to happen anyway. That much of the, well, that's a whole thing. We can, well, maybe in Q&A we'll talk about sort of what Oslo did to sort of dismantle, to try and dismantle any notion of a kind of global Palestinian struggle, right? And to, by even, even the sectioning off of A, B, and C, try to create a kind of ideological and, and, and a divide in the, and also a divide in the political imaginary between those who are living inside of Israel or inside of 48, those who are identified as citizens of Israel and those who were not. All of these things were part and parcel of Oslo, which was never really designed to lead to any kind of, of long-term freedom for Palestinian people, but to serve as a mechanism of surveillance control and honestly to make sure that there would never be a kind of final status solution that would give Palestinians contiguous land with water and roads and access and self-determined political leadership. This is all part of the all part of the struggle. And so by the time the nation state bill comes out in 26 and 26 the nation state bill is proposed and the nation state law is passed a year later, which effectively uh, codifies the idea that Palestine is, excuse me, that Israel is a uh, it's a Jewish state that 
Hebrew is the language, is the only official language, right? That Arabic is a, has, is a prestige language, but not an official language, right? That, that settlement, that effectively saying settlement expansion is a right of, 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 of Israeli self-determination. By framing the language and the policy in this way and moving it toward the right, they became more unabashed in their commitment to, to dismantling Palestine, Palestinian freedom struggle at the same time that we saw the same thing happening in the United States. And so part of the urgency and part of the solidarity was produced out of the desperate conditions of an authoritarian government in each place. And it didn't hurt that the two were kind of having a bromance. Right? It didn't hurt that Netanyahu and Trump were, were, were homies. Right? And, and, and so this also created part of the dynamic. And so when, this, when the delegations happened and, and people were touring, and these weren't just ordinary people, these were people who were organizers, people who were activists, people who were journalists, people who were scholars, people who were operating in the public sphere as a means of shifting or at least attempting to shift black public opinion. We, they were going into cities and seeing, because I remember being, at, we, we went into, uh, we were in Jerusalem at first and we were looking at home evictions. And we were looking at people who were talking about the way that Israeli uh, soldiers would raid their homes. Check the refrigerator to see if there were eggs in the refrigerator. Check the trash and weigh the trash to see how heavy it was. Trying to judge if the people were really living in Jerusalem or whether they were just keeping their home in Jerusalem and really hanging out in Ramallah or al or somewhere else under the idea that if Jerusalem wasn't the center of their life, and there's a center of life policy and law in Palestine, that's, or in, in Jerusalem specifically, it says that if Jerusalem's not the center of your life, then you can lose your home. And so they were literally weighing the trash and checking your freezer for eggs. First of all, if they check my freezer for, my refrigerator for eggs right now, they think I ain't lived there. And I promise you, I haven't moved in 17 years. Eggs, butter, bacon, nothing, just hot sauce. But so, if you, so you go in somebody's house and you have the, the, the Palestinian equivalent of me and ain't nothing in there, but shut the, you, it's like, wait a minute, right? And, and so people are literally being dislocated. People are literally being pushed out. And it stuck with folk. When they saw, we met with people who said that there was a Palestinian kid who had been accused of, have wave, of, of stabbing or attempting to stab a, a police officer. And uh, they said he charged the police officer and the police officer had to kill him. A video tape had emerged and it showed that the kid was unarmed. He was shot and then they planted a knife on him afterward. And they said, can you believe that? The black people were like, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. It's, sounds quite familiar. And so these moments allowed us to see some of the similarities in some of the structures, right? At that moment, the Black Palestinian Transnational Solidarity Movement, the possibilities emerged because we understood policing in a certain kind of way, and we recognized what many have now called the deadly exchange, the relationship between policing in the United States and the training of police in the United States and the training of police in Israel. It's very important, though, to understand, again, that this is a bi-directional thing. Black folk, excuse me, police officers did not need to go to Israel to learn how to kill black folk. The United States did not need to learn from Israel how to kill black folk. And it's important that we say that also because not only is it inaccurate, but it can reinforce anti-Semitic notions of the blood libel. It can reinforce the idea that somehow black Israel is responsible for the death of black folk as opposed to this nation state. Right? But when we look at the training of Israeli officers here, places like Virginia, Maryland, when we look at the training of, uh, of officers including the ones who killed Tyree Nichols. That very police department had been trained in Israel. But it goes both ways. And the, port, the important thing isn't to say who's responsible for the death or who's not. On a grander scale, it's, it's to say what are the structures and the systems that make this happen? One of them is the militarization of police. One is the expansion of the type of weaponry that police have. In, in places like Ferguson, we saw people that had 10 police officers, but they had grenade launchers. These are places that couldn't afford dashboard cameras, but they had mini Uzis that had been manufactured in Israel. Right? It's the idea of the security state, where security becomes the pretext for all types of actions. It becomes the top priority, and, 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 be, and under the name of security, under the guise of security, people are now permitted, or, or people are now uh, almost sometimes even willing, but certainly the state is willing to take away freedoms, rights, liberties, to deny the Constitution. We have one here in the United States. To ignore the basic laws, there's no Israeli Constitution, but to, to ignore the basic laws in the spirit of them. Right? It's to frame people as outsiders. In the context of Palestine, it's, it, Israel is to frame Palestinians as outsiders. It's to frame anybody who is not 
uh, who is different as an outsider and a threat to security and therefore vulnerable to any type of surveillance, any type of, of, of containment, any type of blame, any type of stigmatization. This is the framing of it. And what we've seen in the United States increasingly is the move toward the security state, where hyper surveillance becomes the order of the day, where a, 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 a not just a, a fear of the other and a threat of the other, but a commitment to deny the, the, the rights of the other and those constructed as other. This is part of the hyper security state. So now you've got towns like Ferguson or places like Sheikh Jarrah where folk are vulnerable to violence, vulnerable to surveillance, vulnerable to various forms of otherization. And then the resistance to that is also protested. In Georgia right now, there's a bill that talks about, that, that's criminalizing protest. In the Midwest, several cities in the Midwest, right around here, you've seen bills that make it not illegal to hit somebody with your car when they're protesting. These are the very same laws that we've seen. And again, this isn't Israel's fault. And we see this in other populist authoritarian governments too. If I go into Modi's India, I'm going to see that. If I go in, if I, if, you know, I mean, we go, we go to Brazil, we go multiple places and see a very similar kind of structure, but there is, a, there is a thread here, there is a through line that's important as we talk about these moments and these forms of solidarity, because these moments and these forms of solidarity are what we were responding to. But these moments and forms of solidarity are complicated, they're messy. You know, I talked about, I said I would be talking about the possibilities, but also the limitations of solidarity. and particularly black Palestinian solidarity. Part of what we have to think about when we talk about the limits of this, one is blackness is a very complicated and messy thing. I've spent the last eight years doing field work in East Jerusalem, in uh, the old city. And I remember the first time I walked into the old city of Jerusalem I bumped into a man who would become one of the principal people in my, in my research, uh, uh, a man named Ali Jeddah. Ali Jeddah is uh, an Afro-Palestinian. Uh, his family has been there for several generations. He's of uh, partly Nigerian, although he, he, he tends to, 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 to focus on the... Uh, I haven't eaten in a day, so just forgive me. My brain's moving just a little bit slow. Chad, thank you. Uh, his family's from Chad. He tends to focus on the Chad part of it. Uh, in 1968, Ali was arrested uh, as part of the resistance efforts. Uh, he was in prison for 17 years, and he was only released as part of a major, a mass prisoner swap that occurred uh, during the time of the war when over 1,100 Palestinians were exchanged for three Israelis. And he now lives in the old city, and I saw him and when I saw him, he, he, I thought he was a black tourist. Um, I, I had a decent knowledge of the Middle East. I had a decent knowledge of Palestine. I had a decent knowledge of, of, of Jerusalem. But I didn't have a decent knowledge of, uh, of the Afro-Palestinian community who had been there for years. They'd come uh, as pilgrims. Many had come as part of this, this you know, sort of they, they'd, go, they'd go from Nigeria to Mecca to Medina uh, and then to this thing called Taqdis, say Taqdis al Hajj, they would, they would then go to Masjid al Aqsa to kind of purify or perfect. Taqdis is a really hard word to translate, but it's like a, um, to kind of holify, I'm gonna say, their, uh, I'm, I'm Jesse Jackson, that word, to, to, to uh, their, their, their Hajj, their pilgrim experience. And many of them stayed, some were hired uh, by uh, Amin al Husseini, who was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem to be security. Some were hired to be security of the Aqsa compound because they saw them as bigger and stronger. We could talk about that too. And some were seen as very, very religious, so much that the Jordanian Waqf, the Jordanian Trust, uh, uh, built two pr formerly Mamluk prisons and let them have them, right? These four buildings. So they, they, they've lived there for, for a very long time uh, in these two buildings, right? One is called the Hanging Prison, one is called the, the, uh, the, the Blood Prison. Uh, because that's what they would do in those two respective prisons, and they've taken them over. They've become they've become apartments. They're nice. They're lovely, um, and they and they live there. And uh, they've been there for a very long time. They've been active in the struggle. They've been really the vanguard of the struggle. People like Fatima Bernawi, 
uh, who, who, who actually just passed away a few months ago, uh, people like Ali and Mohammed Jeddah, people like Mohammed Ghost. There, there's a whole long tradition of people who were leaders in the PFLP, who've been leaders in Fet in, in, in Fetah, people who've been leaders in all of these Palestinian political parties, and all of them are Afro-Palestinian. And so I was thinking about immediately. I get, I get excited, you know. I'm a nerd, right? So you know, you know when you're a scholar and you go somewhere, you see some real fly-ish, and you like, yo, all right, this is gonna be my next thing. I think this is gonna be my thing. And I started thinking about what it meant to be black in Palestine. And so I started asking them all these questions about blackness and anti-blackness and racism because I wanted to hear about what it, the, the oppression that black folk felt. And people in this delegation were talking about, oh, there's black people here. There's there's a thing here that we could relate to, right? Uh, and and. It was only after being in the, going back as not in a delegation, but as a, in doing field work and spending a considerable amount of time that they, that they, 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 that I understood what was happening. They all kept saying to me, you know, racism doesn't exist here. This is what Afro Palestinians would tell me, and I'm like, I don't know, because when I'm trying to find this place, they call it Heb Salabid, right? I'm like, I'm uh, Heb Salabid is like, this, you know, Heb, it, it, it's like slave prison, right? Abid is a slur. Right? Um, for, you know, for black folk, you know, I'm like, I'm looking for the you know, hey. fish, right? But, but you say, you know, how did the father club? Nope, but, oh, Hepsalabi, why you ain't just say that? They over there. So there's a way that I'm seeing the racism. I'm trying to buy some candy. I see a little piece of chocolate and they, oh, that's a lab. All right? You're like, oh, it don't hit you till it hits you, right? You're like, oh, wait, that is racist. That's pretty damn racist, right? Right. Head of a slave. It's a chocolate-covered thing, right? Um, but it was only after spending time with him that I, and, and, and many said that it was Islam that it ended all racism, right? Because there's no racism in the Islamic world at all. But what I understood over time is what they were explaining to me not that, that there isn't anti-blackness or various forms of white supremacy that permeates the, the region and even the, 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 the kind of internally within the Palestinian community. They weren't denying that. What they were trying to say that the primary form of racialization that occurs within that space, within that context, is not their blackness. In other words, to use Ruth Wilson, Wilson, Wilson Gilmore's language, the thing that consigns you to premature death in Palestine is not being black. It's being Palestinian. And that was the point that they were trying to make. Right. And so the conception of blackness that we had, I, I had to reconceive what blackness meant within that context. Similar point to what's happening, in, what was happening in Musulada with the Black Panther Party. They weren't black. Right. But they were trying to understand what blackness meant within a particular context. And Afro pessimists who, you know, we could battle and fight it out. But they, they at least got a point on that. Right. There's a certain way that we can think about blackness in a global context and what it signifies. And so anyway, all that to say that part of the tension here when we talk about black Palestinian solidarity is to understand that blackness within that context, it's not enough to just be phenotypically black. Because I, we, I, went, I would go to Jerusalem and, we, and I go to Jerusalem and we talk and it's cool and we go to Jericho, we go, you know, we, we go to all these places, we go to, we go to Tul Karim and it's all solidarity. We all black, it's all solidarity. But the solidarity that we're, that we're connecting to with for me, it's because we look like this, and for them, it's because they're Palestinian. And the reason why I'm making that point is because when we get to the checkpoint and we see the Israeli soldier from Beta Israel, when we see the Ethiopian Israeli soldier, where the solidarity at? Because I'm like, yo, like, do you feel any connection to them? And they're like, of course not. That's my occupier. First time I asked that, I got cuss smooth. I learned so many cuss words. Because this idea that because we're black, that I would have solidarity with the Ethiopian was unthinkable to them, right? And this came up again when the Black Lives Matter folk, or earlier when the Black Lives Matter folk, when we left our delegation and came back home, there were Ethiopians in Israel who had been subjected to various forms of state violence because they were Ethiopian, because they were black, who called us and said, we want to form a Black Lives Matter movement here in Israel, in South Tel Aviv, because these racist police are messing with us. Now you got people like, nah, I, I, right? 
it makes your head spin a little bit, right? Because there is a way that their blackness in Ethiopia, or rather in, 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 in Israel, is subjecting them to various forms of premature death, various forms of state violence. It always has since the 1980s, since Operation Moses and Solomon and, and, and Joshua, since they were airlifted in and Russians were allowed to go right in and they were put in absorption centers when they had to symbolically convert, when their, uh, when their Jewishness was considered illegible by the rabbinate, by the Israeli state, because, it, because they weren't Jewish enough or they weren't really Jewish, despite the fact that they were practicing forms of temple worship that had long preceded rabbinical Judaism. But it didn't matter because their blackness made their Jewishness illegible. There's all kinds of ways that from the, from the, state of the, from the perspective of the United States, I could look there and say, those black folk get in hell. But we also said Black Lives Matter is an anti-imperialist movement. Y'all are occupiers. Y'all are settlers. Y'all are black settlers, but y'all settlers. I could look at the Israelites that moved there in Demona. The black Hebrew Israelites, or the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem who live in Demona. They catch hell. They're from Chicago. I like them. They laugh. They dance. They, you know, they got step sets in the south. You know what I mean? In the, south, in the southern Negev. They, they, they're great people. But they're settlers. Right? So how do we from here, form, when we talk about black form, forms of solidarity, again, race and color, color in the most literal sense cannot be enough. We have to complicate and nuance our understanding beyond a black-white racial paradigm which over-determines over -determines our politics and our resistance efforts in the United States but aren't uh, transferable within other geopolitical contexts. It's simply insufficient because if it were, we'd be marching with Ethiopians. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't have solidarity with them against state violence. Because one Palestinian said to me, does that mean we shouldn't have sort of show solidarity with y'all until y'all denounce patriarchy? Right? It, it can get complicated. It can get messy. But, but part of the point of forging these networks is to complicate our understanding of blackness. The other thing is to understand is that solidarity doesn't mean sameness. As we, as we travel through, and I, I remember being on delegations and, and, and watching and hearing people talk about the evictions, or, or, and not just the evictions in, in Jerusalem, which are complicated, and even the status of a Jerusalemite right, is very different. Right, who have who have residency, who have commas, as opposed to having Hawiya, right, which is a kind of I, I did a West Bank ID, which is different than having that blue passport that is the golden ticket. It's an Israeli passport. Very different journeys, very different ways of navigating the region. But when we went to uh, Khan al Ahmar, which was about to be completely a, a, a Bedouin village, not far from Jerusalem. It, would, it had actually been somewhere. Had, they'd actually been moved once prior in, in, from the South back in the 1950s. Um, they were being evicted. And I remember the delegates saying, this is just like gentrification in the United States. It's not, though. It's, it's just not, right? And that's OK, right? Just like the, the, the notions of blackness aren't the same, but that's OK. Right? The notion of being stateless, the notion of being tried in a civilian court versus a criminal court, a military court, excuse me, as, we, as West, people in the West Bank have. The idea of never having full citizenship, citizenship or the possibility of full citizenship is vastly different than gentrification. That doesn't mean, though, that the force of racial capitalism that, that creates the home evictions in Jerusalem and in Khan al-Ahmar that, 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 that forces, that, 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 that permits the state to tear down Palestinian uh, ex, uh, building expansion and then forces the Palestinians to pay for it. The relocation of people from Jerusalem to Ramallah as an attempt to kind of force the hand in a final status commitment so that Palestinians ultimately lose Jerusalem and choose Ramallah as the, as, as the kind of administrative capital of some Bantustan. I mean, no extra charge for that comment. I'm just saying, this is the vision. All of that stuff is messy and that is a force of racial capitalism, the same kinds that lead us to, to, to detention here, the kinds that lead us to ev home evictions here, the kind that lead us to gentrification here. But the conditions are not the same. That is not gentrification. Palestinians aren't wrestling with Starbucks being built in their neighborhood, right? This is complicated. But in, the in the same way that Palestinians aren't wrestling with long, deep standing traditions of slavery and being descendants of slavery. And, be, and wrestling with forms of white supremacy that make them vulnerable to, not just to premature death, but to forms of caging, not just as political prisoners, but in all sorts of ways that make them incredibly vulnerable to death, to harm, to trauma, to, 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 to we go going down the list. So I'm not saying one is worse than the other, I'm simply saying they're not the same. But unfortunately, sometimes in order for us to recognize or for it to be legible, we have to see it as the same. And I'm saying they don't have to be. 
And oftentimes when we bump into those tensions, we pull back. Another fundamental issue, which I started to talk about here, is anti-blackness within the Palestinian community and within the Arab community and within the Muslim world. I was just reading a book today. Uh, what is the name of that book? I'm gonna come back to it, but it's by Michael Muhammad Knight. It's about the Ansar. Have you seen this book? It's about the Ansar community. You get you, you cited it like 17 times. Um, and but there's a way that black folk. How can I put this? Let me just say first of all, this is racism in all these places, right? There's fundamental racism, racism and anti-black. Suad writes about it. Other folk write about it. This idea. Uh, that black folk are always illegible as Muslims, that black folk are, are, are not read as, as sufficiently Muslim, properly Muslim, truly Muslim. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into Masjid al-Aqsa and I get stopped, right? They, they, they only stop people walking into Aqsa who don't look Muslim, right? I mean, if you ask the soldiers, and I ask the soldiers all the time because that's what ethnographers do, I say, why do you, who do you decide, how do you decide who to stop? Oh, we stop people who don't look Muslim, right? Now, I admit, I, I was, you know, I wasn't wearing like a jellabia. But like by like day 17, like they, you know what I mean? And, and they basically said, we stopped black folk. And, and the occasional white, Europe, European looking white Muslim, we stopped them too, right? We stopped people with tattoos, very few things. But it was like, we stopped people with tattoos, we stopped people who look like agents, we, we stopped people, you know, who look violent, and we stopped black people. I mean, it was like, and then they give you a test. I'm, I'm, I'm going a little off topic for a second, but they give you a test, right? They say, they say recite Al-Fatiha, right? So then you recite Al-Fatiha. Yeah. You, that gets you through. Not if you're black. He said, like, give me another one. All right, I'll do Surah Al-Nasr. Okay, cool. Surah al Baqarah and you're in. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, but, <laughs> Muslim jokes, but the, the point is, after I did the test, he turned to the other soldier and said, is he right? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> it was like the literacy tests of the South when like white people who couldn't read were administering literacy tests to black folk to see if they could vote. I mean, it was mind blowing, right? But there's a way that that's not just what happens going into the Aqsa compound. That's what's happening in many ways, gaining entry into any kind of, uh, in many sections of the Muslim world. Right? And so that's a certain kind of anti-blackness, that black folk have to learn Islam from, black, from, from brown, that black people have to learn Islam from brown people. Right? There's anti-black racism, because even you spend enough time um, um, among communities and you start to hear things. Every Palestinian who I interviewed for my study, everybody who I talk to, you know, it's often like, oh yeah, there's no race, we don't see race, we don't see race, we don't see race. And then you ask them about marriage. Conversation is wildly different. You know what I mean? Um, and sometimes then they blame it on Islam or they blame it on tradition, right? But it's fascinating to think about the various forms of anti-blackness. We talk about, and it's not just among Palestinians. We had these conversations about Jewish store owners. We had this conversation about Korean store owners. We've had this conversation about Palestinians. I mean, I'm in, in, a, in a place just like Chicago, in a place just like in Detroit, right? George Floyd is killed in Minnesota, and the store owner where he allegedly gave the counterfeit uh, bill is Palestinian. And there's a conversation that we have to have about what it means for Arab and Muslim uh, uh, store owners to occupy black communities. What are the social relationships? What are the economic relationships? What are the extractive relationships that exist? I mean, I remember in the 90s, we'd walk into, 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 in, 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 in Philadelphia, walk into black Muslim stores that's, that were selling. Everything was haram on the wall, right? But they'd be willing to sell them to us. What does that mean? Right? So there's a way that any relationship can be, will be fraught if it's, if it's undergirded by anti-blackness. And so black Palestinian relations have to be understood like that and they also have to be understood as being bi-directional again. Black folk are marching for Palestine. We need y'all at the Black Lives Matter rally. Right? I'm not saying you're not and I'm not speaking to anyone in particular. I'm saying this is literally the quotes I'm getting from, my, from, from the field. This is what people are saying, that they're beginning to see these relations be very, very one-sided. And so part of what we have to think about when we talk about the limits and the possibilities of black Palestinian transnational solidarity is what is the commitment to black liberation? And what is the commitment to an understanding that black liberation is bound up in Palestinian self-determination and in so, and, and, and Palestinian liberation? And to what extent do we understand that within the context of a broader global political imaginary that demands that all of us get free? And what, finally, what price are we willing to pay for it? What's at stake when we decide that we can have one more election with a person who's going to support settlement expansion? 
What does it ma What does it mean when we elect a person in Congress who continues to support Zionist colonial occupation? Right? What does it mean when we say, "Well, that's not our issue" or "That's not their issue"? Right? At what point does our word does, does the word become flesh? At what point do we have a commitment to a kind of engaged political project that allows all of us to get free? That's the work of dreaming. That's the work of struggling. That's the work of organizing. That's, I don't have an answer to that question. As a professor, I, don't, I try not to answer too many questions. I like to say things are complicated. But it is complicated, and it's messy, and that's a, and that's a political project that we're going to have to undertake collectively. Anyway, I'm going to pause there because it's, it's been a long day. Uh, I'd love to have conversation. We can talk as long as y'all want. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just shout them out, and I'll, I'll, I'll say them back so people on the stream can make sure they hear it. Unless there's a mic, I always prefer a mic, but. Oh wait, let me see if it worked. Testing, testing, cool, cool. Sorry, I go into host mode fast, you know. Hey, uh, my name is Rashad. Um, uh, I'm an Arab living in Detroit, and um, what you just said about like the social relations of extractivism, I wanted to ask a question about that. Um, what do you think it is, or like you know, you you were talking about like needing to commit to liberation, but what do you think is the like things that we have to interrogate, you know, for Arabs or other minorities who might live. Um, in like predominantly black areas to do to like find the politic that is rooted for like you know liberation. I don't know if that makes sense, but just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think we have to begin with the question of interrogating anti-blackness. We have to start there, right? Do you think black people are human? I mean, some real fundamental questions. Like what is your relationship to black struggle? What is your relationship to black liberation? Um, why are you in this community? Is it purely because the rent is lower? Is it purely because these people buy cigarettes and alcohol? Or whatever the thing is. I, mean, I don't want to stereotype either. And everyone doesn't sell cigarettes and alcohol. But often the fraught relationship emerges when people come in, sell us stuff we shouldn't have. I mean, this, again, this is the language of the, of, of the people, right? Um, and then don't talk to us, don't engage us, don't build on our communities. I, I think the question is what, for me, is like what does the community need in order to thrive or in order to feel like the person coming in is, uh, is invested in them and in the community and not purely in an extractive relationship. Um, there are organizations in place like, places like Chicago, uh, like Iman, uh, that do that work, right? They're, they're committed to working with store owners. They're committed to working with uh, communities to say, all right, you're here, but what are you gonna do for and with the community while you're here? And I think that's the question. If we reduce it to purely, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna sell my stuff and I'm gonna go home, you're never gonna have a fully healthy relationship. And I think part of what black people have said since the beginning of time, what, at least in America, is y'all don't do that nowhere else. Most places don't even let y'all in. And if y'all are in, you have to have a healthy relationship. What do you, what's your relationship to the local schools? What's your relationship to the local politics? What are you giving? And then on a purely interpersonal micro interaction level, do you speak to us when we come in? Do you talk to us? You're, it's the same 50 people coming every day. Do you know their names? Right? There are ways that you can engage community that make them feel human and make them feel seen and make them feel whole. Uh, do you call the police on them? Right? I mean, these are fundamental questions that we can ask and wrestle with, and I think these are things we have to do. And as black folk, we have to interrogate Islamophobia, Orientalism, you know, ver various forms of bias and, 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 and prejudice. We have to interrogate that stuff, too. I'm, I'm not, again, it can't be a one-sided engagement, but we have to think about these things, right? And I think through the thinking and the working and the, and the caring is when we, is, is part, of, part of how we saw some of those bonds of solidarity built in Ferguson was because the Ferguson organizers, among the Ferguson organizers, uh, there were Palestinians who had been working for black liberation. They've been organizing and struggling with black folk. And so those black folk came to understand Palestinian issues and Palestinian struggle and, and came to want to fight, right? And vice versa. 
right? But we had to show up for each other. We had to stand up for each other. And, and, and that commitment has to be there, not just in the, at, the, at the moment of political struggle, but in the politics of everyday life. And that's the part that I think we sometimes miss. Mark, uh, my name is Tarek. So I was going to ask a longer question, but I'll make it shorter. Um, so I organize locally here, and one of the issues I felt like I felt like there's a big momentum happening, like early in, like after George Floyd and everything else happening with transnational solidarity. But locally, it seems as though, especially as the pandemic went on longer than we thought it would, yeah. our organizing has been fractured. Like we see Shot Spotter going across a lot of cities, Cop City in Atlanta. Um, and so it's been hard to organize locally, let alone globally. So I guess, like, what is your assessment, briefly, because I know this could be a course in itself, on, like, transnational global solidarity, given that we have so many fires to put out locally, and so many Palestinians also have their own fires to put out locally? I, I mean, I, I think that's always the challenge, even before, during, and after pandemic, right, is there's enough, we got enough stuff on our plate. So, so part of it is I think you need a type of political analysis that makes the solidarity relevant, urgent, and useful, right? If we always see, if, if it always feels as if when I engage in this struggle over here, when I should do solidarity work over there, that I'm actually stopping what I'm doing to go do this other thing, that's a particular framing, right? Like, like uh, yeah, I, I, we just got so many black people getting killed, I just can't think about Hawada right now. That's not the right way to think about it. I think part of through our political education, we have to engage and teach folk that these struggles aren't just parallel, they don't just mirror each other, but that they're interconnected. And, and, and that's, why we, that's part of why the deadly exchange analysis was important, although it was often misrepresented. Right? We need to be able to show that we can't stop, we can't stop what's happening in Hawada if we don't stop what's happening in, 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 in Detroit. Right? That, that these things are connected because the systems are connected. We have to, we have to make that clear to folks that Cop City is an outgrowth of a certain kind of military, police militarism that's global. We have to have that analysis. And then folk who in Atlanta who are trying to stop Cop City won't feel like it's a distraction to talk about what's happening in another place, right? That's part of it, right? The other thing is I think we have to use the tools at our disposal. Um, I think we don't actually spend enough time and energy using what we have. I mean, we figured out how to we, I mean, faculty don't want to say this. Like, we don't want to say it too loud. We figured out how to kind of do our whole job without ever coming in, right? Like, I mean, there's no real need for a faculty meeting in person, a dissertation defense in person. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that can happen from the crib now, right? We kind of have to justify our existence and why we got office space and all that stuff before the university sells it to, like, Chick-fil-A or so. You know, universities, the neoliberal universities are ruthless, right? But there's a way that we could do a whole lot of stuff now that we couldn't before. Um, I think we have to be creative in our, in our organizing strategies. I mean, so, wh whether it's marching together, organizing together, tweeting together, uh, these digital pop-ups that people do, these digital uh, flash mobs that have engaged, um, international conferences are, are bringing us together. Um, what are the organizing strategies, the right, you, you, I mean, I, I, that's what I'm saying is we have so many tools that make the world smaller in a sense that we can access more of it, right? Or, or as organizers, the world's bigger to us. We can get more places, right? This time, space, compression has made a whole lot of stuff possible. And so I think part of it is, again, I think the big part is, is framing it as these aren't competing issues for our time, but that there's an overlap. At the same time, conceding that, yeah, of course, I got to spend more time stopping black people from getting killed in my neighborhood than I might, than I might personally, personally spend dealing with Uyghurs or dealing with what's happening in Kashmir or dealing, not because it's not as important at the human level, because I have an urgency toward home. But that king logic of when dogs bite us in Birmingham, we bleed everywhere, has to permeate our political analysis. But then I'm also saying um, the tools and the technologies of the moment, and I write about this in my, in my book, uh, Seen and Unseen, uh, you know, they've, they allow the world to bear engaged with, I don't gotta go to Palestine to see what happened in Gaza. Right? We used to have to do that, but now we can see it. Now on social media, I can distribute stuff. I'm looking at uh, Mohammed Lukud, right, who, who's been writing and thinking. Uh, now he's writing for the nation. Now he's live streaming what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah, right? Like, like it's no longer like 
so, so I'm saying there's ways that we can use the tools and technologies of the day also as a means of bringing people in, of, of making our solidarity communities broader and thicker, of making our action more, more, more tangible. I think we have to be creative in thinking about that because I think, I think sometimes we use old organizing strategies for new contexts and, 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 and we lose opportunities to really build solidarity bonds. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hill, for your talk. Um, incredibly inspiring. Just a, a quick um, remark that kind of confirms what you were saying. I, I took students uh, from the University of Michigan to Palestine for three-week immersive programs in, in learning about the occupation. And my students, some of whom were, were black students from Michigan, uh, we met with uh, someone who had been a soldier. He was an Ethiopian Jew. Mm. And they truly wrestled, I did too, I'm Palestinian, with hearing him make these quite unnuanced claims for the entire land, for Jews, including... It was, it was incredible. It was quite a trip. But yeah. I thank you, and I have two questions, if you allow me. Yeah. One of which is I'm very interested in your thinking about um, solidarities, the limits and possibilities with indigenous peoples in the Americas. Uh, that is increasingly coming into fruition and attention. Um, and so I'm interested in that kind of triangulation, if you think of it, or, or across these three groups. The other question, very much in my mind, is how do you think about grappling with the minefield that grows of increasing um, censure on labor accusations of anti-Semitism? Oh, wow. but, Does that happen a lot? <laughs> I heard some. I read something about that. Good. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That are leveled against Palestinians, uh, Black Americans, and any solidarity. So I'm just very interested in how your own mullings over those. And thank you very much. Yeah. No. Thank you. Um, and to your first question, I, I, I think, to be frank, I, I think I need to do more work, thinking and working and organizing with indigenous communities. This, people like Stephen Salaita have been writing and helping us think through this triangulation quite interestingly in, in his writing on, even on Canaan and, and, and thinking about uh, what indigeneity means and, and, and what it means to, to use that language of indigene indigeneity in very particular ways for political mobilization, but also to think about how, uh, how to, in, in some of our delegation work, we've brought uh, indigenous folk from the United States to Palestine, which was incredibly powerful and, and, and eye-opening, and we learned a bunch. Um, but I think that has to be more central to the conversation. I also think that it's, it's baffling and, and fundamentally uh, hypocritical for us to fly all the way across the country to deal with, with this question and not deal with what, we're, what we have right here in the United States or throughout the Americas. And I think very often uh, that is less, uh, we, that is less of uh, an urgent struggle for us right now uh, in terms of what we prioritize uh, politically, and in terms of what we mobilize for, what we organize for, what we vote for, then we should. Um, and so, you know, I would say it's an area of growth even for me in terms of what I need to read and think about to, to, in terms of strategy. At, at the level of like analysis, of course, I, 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 I agree, I, I get it, but uh, I, I need to read and think more deeply about that question. Um, in terms of uh, the weaponization of anti-Semitism, um, it's, in, it's, it's only getting worse uh, in multiple ways. Um, the Inter International Holocaust Remembrance Association, the IHRA, um, has offered a definition of uh, anti-Semitism that has been stretched even beyond its original. The intent of the IHRA wasn't to become public policy. It wasn't to become the kind of template or the, the reference point for deciding various forms of anti-Semitism in the public sphere, or et cetera. But what the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism does is that it makes anti-Semitism not just um, hatred, violence, harm against Jews for being Jews, right? but it also expands it such that it includes a critique of the state of Israel. The IHRA definition of anti-Semitism includes uh, the denial of Jewish self-determination. 
And so if, the, if, if you say that the denial of Jewish self-determination is an act of anti-Semitism, at the same time that you have, for example, nation state laws, which say that all of historic Palestine, all of Israel, all of the West Bank, all of Gaza, and maybe even more at this point, who knows, um, is, is part of the Jewish kind of uh, manifest destiny, an Israeli manifest destiny, then to, then to push back against any of it could be seen as an act of anti-Semitism, right? To critique the formation of the state of Israel could be seen as an act of anti-Semitism. And there are already laws in the land. I mean, there's a, there's a Nekba law. I don't know if you know. I mean, think about like the Nekba law in Israel, right? Which makes it illegal to commemorate uh, the formation of the state of if, if, to, to commemorate Israeli Independence Day is anything but a positive thing. Effectively, if you if you if you if you mourn Israeli Independence Day, uh, that's seen that's illegal, and state funds can be drawn from any organization that does it. That's obviously not for anyone but Palestinian citizens of Israel. And so there's a way that both at the civil level and at the criminal level, uh, and now we're talking about even at, uh, kind of at the discursive level, we're saying that, it, that, that the, the expansion of settlements, the expansion of uh, the Israeli settler colonialism cannot be critiqued, cannot be challenged, and, and it's seen as an act of anti-Semitism. This is part of a broader movement of political Zionism, right? Which is to equate Jewishness with this, with, with, to, 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 to create Zionism with Jewishness, right? And, and, and the political Zionist project of saying that the formation of the state of Israel is, a, is the embodiment, the full embodiment of Jewishness and Jewish identity and Jewish destiny. And so to critique Israel as a nation state would then make you anti-Semitic, right? This has become the discourse, right? And to, to but it's also, it's, it's also policed the conversation. So, I mean, we talked about, I mean, and again, it was an Israeli uh, military leader who called it a pogrom in, in Hawada. But there are many people who would say that you can't say pogrom, right? Because that's exclusively used for the, 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 the ugly, vicious attacks that happened to Jews in Eastern Europe. And so that's, that's that language. I remember, and I'm old enough to remember now, when, when we would talk about the African diaspora, people said diaspora, the term diaspora can't be used in that way, right? Because it's supposed to think about international, it's supposed to be thinking about kind of Jewish internationalism or, or, or global Jewry, right? Uh, there are people who say that the use of apartheid, right? That you, we, that you can't talk about the Israeli state as, as an apartheid nation because that is anti-Semitic. And so the, 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 the terms of the debate have been policed so heavily uh, that it's hard to have a conversation. Now, we have to be clear here. Anti-Semitism is real. Anti-Semitism is global. Anti-Semitism is rising. But a big part of why anti-Semitism is rising is because of the work of folk like Trump and his cronies who are themselves anti-Semitic, but deeply committed to Zionism, right? Evangelical Christians, Christian Zionists, this long tradition of folk who are willing to help advance this bizarrely expansive and intellectually dishonest definition, right? At the same time that they're committed to a kind of political outcome and, and as Christian Zionists, an eschatological outcome, a, a religious outcome, that, that is itself anti-Semitic. I mean, they, they, they effectively want Jews to return to Israel. They effectively want a Messiah to come, and some will be converted, others will be killed. Right? This, the end of this Christian evangelical Zionist stage play leads to, to the death of Jewish people, which is itself an anti-Semitic religious narrative. Right? The equa equating the Israeli nation state, or, or rather, to equate Jewishness with the actions of any nation state, because let's be clear, violence, extraction, exploitation, dislocation, militarism, all, racialism, all this stuff is not Israel exclusively, it's the, that, that, those are marks of the nation state. The nation state is by definition attempting in a kind of barbarian sense to have a monopoly on violence. So if we're understanding the nation state is, I don't want Jewishness associated with that. I don't want Islam associated with that. I don't want Christianity associated with that, right? And I'm not reducing is, uh, Judaism to a religion as much as I'm saying, um, not at all, in fact. But what I'm saying is, is that the, these visions of Zionism, of political Zionism, which is the only iteration of Zionism that we've seen materially in our lives, right, um, are themselves rooted in very anti-Semitic outcomes, anti-Semitic uh, consequences, anti-Semitic approaches, and sometimes, frankly, in the case of Trump and his cronies, anti-Semitic people. And so for me, it's a challenge, right? Because we have to be willing to speak the truth, though it may be bitter, 
Um, but we must, but we also have to, at a practical level, navigate these landmines, right? And then in terms of building alliances, particularly with the next generation of, of Jews, many of whom are progressive on this issue, we also want to be sensitive to the traditions and the, the values and the ideas that they bring into the conversation, because we don't want to alienate people either. But just like we won't hold ourselves hostage to white tears, right, in America in the context of racism, we also have to have an honest and difficult conversation about the political struggles in the region, right? We can never ignore anti-Semitism. We can never ignore the need to fight it, to identify it, to organize with our Jewish brothers and sisters to, to, to end anti-Semitism. We cannot, at the same time, we cannot concede the rhetorical, political, or discursive territory that allows people to say that saying that Israel is an apartheid state is anti-Semitic. We can't concede that, right? We can't concede uh, that settler colonialism, they're calling it settler colonialism, is an act of anti-Semitism. We can't yield that ground. We have to be self-critical and self-aware about anti-Semitism. We have to recognize when a trope is being used or when we're smuggling in something that we hadn't considered. We have to be honest about that. We have to correct our, our course when we do that. Again, we can't be obstinate about this stuff. But we can't, we can't, but what we can't do is say, all right, we know this is a disingenuous argument, but all right, we just won't say that word. And we just won't do that thing. And we just, because at some point you, you're left with nothing. Right? And, and, so, and so, that's, so I'm very concerned with that. Um, and in my own experience, um, there, there's a moment, you know, I, I, I gave a speech to the United Nations. And I often, obviously, replay the last eight, ten seconds of it, right? Because that's, you know, the river to the sea is what, why I don't work at sea and it no more, right? Allegedly, ostensibly. Right? I don't know, right? Maybe you ain't like me anyway. But... <laughs> yeah, it probably didn't, right? I don't, I don't keep jobs long. Um, media jobs. Um, but then there's a way that I often think, like, if not that, would it have been another part of the speech? If not that speech, would it have been the next speech, right? There's a way that if you're, if you're speaking the truth on various issues, the people who are affected by those outcomes are always going to resist, right? And And, and so... You know, sometimes I'm like, dang, I could have I still done this exact same work if I had just not said, if I had just said, like, window to the wall or something, right? Something different, right? Could, could, what, the outcome could have been different. Life could have been different. Um, I'm sorry. Huh? It's being a little silly. Don't mind me. Um, but I'm not convinced. That, as time goes on, I'm not convinced that everybody debates in good faith. You know, and, and that makes it, I had, a, I had last week, I, I, I was in, I, I, on my show for Al Jazeera that comes on tomorrow. I, I interviewed Bremer, uh, Paul Bremer, and also uh, John Bolton. So the two principal architects of the uh, Iraq war, occupation, devastation, violation of international law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember at the end, my, my producer was so angry with me at the end of my interviews. She's like, why do you continue to engage them in good faith? Why do you keep asking them questions as if, she's like, you're such an academic. You keep talking to them as if, if you just make a good argument that they'll be convinced. She said, Mark, they're fucking liars. <laughs> they know they're lying. They know they're doing this. And it's not an accident. And you, they're not in good, and, and so it's, and I, I know it's a long winded way of saying, I don't know. But there's a way that I don't know how to get, I don't know how to solve that problem. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to solve the problem. I know that we can't yield that ground. I know that we have to push back against these definitions. I know we can't allow them, our language to be co-opted by anybody uh, in any political struggle, right? Whether it's around abolition, whether it's around Palestine, or rather it's around reproductive justice, whatever the thing is. I know that. I just don't, at a tactical level, I'm, I'm still, I, I, I still find it very challenging to think through how to do that and still win. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Hill. I really appreciated um, your talk and the way you kind of centered settler colonialism, racial capitalism, 
um, imperialism in our, in our discussion today. Um, I'm curious as to whether there's opportunities right now to capitalize on the contradictions that are being raised by the ironclad support of the United States for Ukraine at this particular moment in time while many other um, you know, invasions, occupations are ongoing um, in places like Palestine, um, Syria, Yemen, et cetera. Um, are there opportunities that we can harness as organizers, as academics in this moment um, mm. around these contradictions that allow us to devise a, a stronger anti-imperialist movement, right, that can push back on, on Zionism and other, you know. That's um, a great question. Yeah, um, I think the answer is yes. Yes and no, right? At the, I, I, I don't think that, I don't think, it'll, initially I thought you were asking, would that be an opportunistic moment to help reshape American pol policy? And I was like, well, no, right? They know they're contradictory. The United States doesn't have feelings and has interests, you know, and wherever those interests are served, that's how the politics is going to go. There'll be anti-occupation here, pro-occupation here, pro-terror, you know, they'll call this person a terrorist and fund them, they'll call this person, you know, we, we know the deal, right? Um, but I do think, I think two things. I think one, it's a moment for us, at the level of political education and organizing, it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to challenge ourselves and to think about our politics differently. So um, the average, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many students of mine are like putting up like flags for Ukraine and, and changing their Twitter and Instagrams to Ukraine, you know? And I think it's at that moment that we can have an intervention, not a military intervention, but a, a, a pedagogical intervention um, to talk about, okay, what's at stake here? Why are we taking this position on Ukraine? Why, what are the politics that undergird it? And how, if we take that, if, if, if we, you know, like some Kantian categorical imperative, we would say, if we, were, if we were to govern all of our political relationships by those same logics and principles, what would we look like in each of these spaces? Um, and I think that's where you can get somewhere interesting. I, let, me, let me take a step back to, to answer your question. When I think about Dr. King's 1967 Riverside speech, right, 1967 when King walks in, Martin Luther King walks into Riverside Church and explains why he opposes the war in Vietnam, that's the kind of intervention that I'm talking about, right? Where he's able to not just say, look, I, I support nonviolence, peace is not just a, nonviolence isn't just a, a tactic for me, it's not just a strat tactic, it's a strategy, it's not just a strategy, it's a philosophy for me, right? It's a worldview for him, right? And so I have to kind of navigate all these issues in the same way. But, but he was also, he also talked about the fact that black folk and white folk who can't even live on the same block in the United States are being sent to Vietnam to fight and kill people. Right? He talked about the economic contradictions. He talked about the moral contradictions, but, but he also laid out the kind of interplay between war and, and poverty and race that was governing these actions across the globe. And so, people, so then black folk, or whoever was wise, not just black folk, in fact, it was probably not largely black folk who, who consumed the speech in, in this particular way, were able to say, oh, wait a minute, why are we supporting this? Or if we are supporting this, why are we not supporting that? I think the, the, the intervention in Ukraine and the, and the, the spectacle of it is an, the media spectacle of it, is a perfect opportunity for us to engage other conversations in that way at the level of political education. And I said, we said, I said the same thing when, when, we were, when, we were, when our hearts were bleeding for France with a bombing. When in Lebanon, that same week, there were bombings, right? We can use those moments, but that also requires a responsible, in addition to the political education at the grassroots level, it, re it requires a responsible media. Right, a media that will actually cover what's happening. Right? I mean, if you, some of the students here don't remember this, but the war in Iraq, which is now wildly unpopular, everybody hated it, you know, at the time, it was like kissing a baby saying we're gonna to go to war in Iraq. The idea of weapons of mass destruction coming from Saddam Hussein, even though there was no evidence of it, there was no uranium being enriched, there were no, the international community wasn't saying this, Trump's own people, Rumsfeld wasn't even, I mean, there were so many people who said no, didn't matter, it was common sense. Phil Donahue, just to name one person among, I'm not even to talk about the Amy uh, Goodmans and the grassroots activists and the black anti-war folk and all the people, but like Phil Donahue had a show on MSNBC and it got canceled, you ain't seen Phil Donahue since. Why? Because he spoke out, of, he, he had the audacity to question the legitimacy of the war itself. But when you work for companies that make their money off war, that's bad for a bit with, with uh, what, uh, Gil Scott Harris say, everybody love peace, problem is you can't make no money off of it, right? And, and so when it, it's, it's within that context um, that, we need, that, that we have to recognize that speaking out and speaking the truth is, not, is, is difficult. 
right? And it's often not just fear that governs these relationships. It's also seduction. In other words, they don't, it's not just repressive. It's not just, yo, you're going to lose your job if you say this. It's also what advantages do you get? What access do you get when you stand up and trumpet the war? Right, be Speaker of the House. Uh, Mark, thank you, um, as always, for your talk. Um, I wanted to go back to um, the question that uh, our sister asked um, about this conflation between Zionism and anti-Semitism, but specifically in the context of your analysis. So you spoke a bit about the um, United Nations speech, the implications of that for you on CNN, and not necessarily the implications for that for you at Temple. Um, but I remember that. They tried. They tried it, though. They did. Um, and so I'm wondering if you might speak about, given your situatedness, of how you are interpreting colleges and universities becoming both an apparatus of legitimacy for and an extension of this political Zionism and the Israeli nation state, and what that means for folks like you who are uh, deeply committed to this and public about it, and how they might navigate this terrain um, as we're seeing, I think, the increasing role of this enterprise, if I can call it that, the higher education enterprise, in advancing this logic. Um, and I say this in part um, based from an exercise that we did in one of my classes. We had a unit on anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and Christian dominance. And the students that we pulled up a website of an organization that's keeping track, basically, of anti-Semitism on college and university campuses. Amongst that website, there's a list of- From a Canary Mission? I don't know if it was that. It, it might have been another one. I don't think uh -huh. it was Canary Mission. Well, Maybe. Because they're ostensibly keeping track of anti Right. right. Um, and in part of that exercise, they were just saying, oh, does anything appeal basically to students? You know, I'm sort of minding my own business. And there's a list of basically anybody who signed to support BDS. And they're like, oh, Dr. Davis is on this list. Oh, shit. And I'm finding out in class in this moment that this is happening. Um, I was like, oh, this is interesting. And that's when these interventions happen. But anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that you might speak to sort of the role of the college, university, the higher education enterprise in this sort of effort of legitimization. So, so there's a way that the university in the ideal space should be a protective space, right? It should be a space to be protected from dangerous ideal. To be, it should be a space to protect people who have counterintuitive, dangerous, unpopular, controversial ideas. It should be a space where you can nurture and develop ideas. It should be a place where you won't be politically taken down for what you believe, whatever that thing might be. Um, as a matter of practice, we simply know that's not true. There are lots of things, lots of topics, lots of subjects where people lose their jobs all the time, right? Um, I mean, I say lots, but it ain't lots. It's enough. But, um, but at different junctures in history, the things you can and cannot talk about shift and change, right? Um, I think uh, universities are under pressure. And I'm not speaking specifically of, anti -Zion, of Zionism or anti-Zionism right now. I'm speaking in broader sense. Universities, universities are increasingly like multinational corporations. They're increasingly technocratic. Uh, university presidents are much more, uh, they, they move much more like corporate CEOs uh, than ever before. Um, and we see all the things that happen uh, when, when you're governed by neoliberal logics. We see uh, casualization of labor. We see like the adjunctification of our teaching forces, the exploitation of graduate student labor, the to, uh, unnecessary tuition hikes. We see um, our, our, our support staff, janitorial staff, kitchen staff, security staff, grossly underpaid. We see the kind of encroachment on neighborhoods and communities, the, ex the extraction of, of, of all sorts of resources from them, including dislocation of residents in various places. I mean, this is, this is just the modern universe. And so it's almost like the way we talk about the violence being a, 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 a defining feature of the modern nation state. Like this is kind of the defining feature of, of, of the modern university. Um, and, when you, and, and so a lot of the pressure that universities respond to is political and economic pressure. So if I am supporting the war in Ukraine and I have a strong base of support that uh, feels the opposite, then university is going to be like, yo, Mark, what you doing? That's been my experience. I'll give you an example. I've talked about this on a documentary. I was cri critical of Bill Cosby um, as a junior faculty member. And not even the, the, his, 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 his uh, sexual violence, alleged sexual violence, whatever, I don't want to sue me for his sexual violence. Um, but his critique of the poor his NAACP speech, I, was, I, I criticized and wrote an op-ed about it. Bill Cosby was on the Board of Trustees at the time. 
This is before he was in, incarcerated for sexual assault. He was on the board of trustees. I got a call the next day. Department chair, dean, the dean. I don't know nobody. I don't even know where the bathroom at yet. I'm getting emails from board members telling me to stop talking about Bill Cosby. Because he was about to donate money for a new building. And they say, we don't disagree with what you're saying. We just, we really want this building. <laughs> I mean, they were, they, they, there was no finesse. They, they said this literally. This is how universities work. Um, not all of them and not all contexts. Some people defend free speech. and defend. So, but my point is, in many ways, university, because like, like the nation state, it's governed by interests rather than feelings. Um, it, it's not, I don't, I don't think that universities have necessarily a, a, a particular political disposition that inclines them to say no to Palestinian freedom or yes to Palestinian freedom. I think it's often driven by how they're, how they're being influenced. Um, now I want to be very clear. That doesn't. I'm not saying for the moles and the muhabbat in the room that like that like um, that Jewish money is driving universities. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what many forces, many people um, drive universities of all sorts, all shapes, all stripes. Um, and it's important for us to think about that. When I got fired from CNN, a little while after that, my dean. Uh, came to me and said, you know, I just want to let you know that the board is meeting today. They're having a meeting and either you're going to be fired, you're going to lose your endowed chair, you're going to be suspended, or they're going, they're going to write a letter of uh, censure, or they're going to do nothing. And they're not going to do nothing. See, I'll let you know in about eight hours. So as you can imagine, that was a long eight hours. At the end of the day, the board decided to um, just write a letter of censure. The first one in Temple's history, I do believe. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And the board of trustees said that I blackened the name of Temple. and said that it was the grossest thing and most disgusting thing he'd ever witnessed, my UN speech. Do you know what his job is when he's not on the board? He's Bill Cosby's attorney. So there's like multiple like, dots there to connect. But I'm like, you represent Bill Cosby and I'm the most disgusting thing you've ever heard? Wow. There, the board had, had a point of view, they had a perspective. Um, they were being pressured by organizations that said you gotta do something about this guy. There were donors who said if you, if you keep Mark, we're not gonna donate anymore. That's, this is what the president told, the president called me in his office and said, hey, if you don't stop, we don't know how much money we're going to lose in donations. This is what the, this is what the president, Dick Englert at the time, told me. Um, and he said, you need to think about how much money you've lost the university and how you can repay us. This is how universities work, man. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I, I, I do know that uh, when I think about the role of the university in this, again, I think about the ideal space, right, where we could be the intellectuals in exile like Edward Said talked about. Uh, but I, as the more that universities are, are, are vulnerable to outside influence, political, economic, social, whatever, the harder that is. And because there's an economic incentive to dismantling tenure and, and casualizing the labor, more and more faculty will not be protected from this. So when you speak on prison abolition, when you call Trump a white supremacist, when you speak out, whatever the thing is, you're gonna be more and more vulnerable. So I see the university becoming increasingly complicit um, in the silencing of academics, the punishing of ac academics, the exiling of academics. Again, our brother Stephen Salaita hasn't, still hasn't returned to a United States university, right? Um, this is dangerous. These are dangerous times. And the irony is the very people leading the charge and prosecuting this war 
are the people who say they love free speech, the people who say they defend free speech, the people who say they hate cancel culture, right? But there's always an exception. That's why I wrote a book called Except for Palestine. Because they cool with canceling, they, they cool with canceling you for that. They're cool with cancel culture for that, right? So don't tell me you're for free speech, you're for academic freedom, you're for the uncomfortable real truth until it comes to stuff y'all don't like. Um, but unfortunately, those are the people lead, the DeSantis's of the world are leading the charge to dismantle the mechanisms that protect free speech, that pr protect a vibrant public sphere, that protect dissenting views. And I find that deeply dangerous. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.